Good morning, everyone. We are in week three of our of our Lenten season, um, where we take these moments, these Sundays, as kind of a, a break from Lent, this, this season of, of repentance and self-sacrifice, um, so that we can kind of recognize the, these Sundays, these mini Easters, as we call them, leading up to Easter Sunday. And so throughout this Lenten season, um, we have been in the midst of a series called Good Enough, where we are recognizing that so often in our lives, we try to climb the ladder, the ladders of success, whether it's in our careers or in our homes or in our bank accounts or at school or wherever it might be. We try to be the best, produce the best, have the best, the most, whatever it might be. And so often that leaves us feeling empty and alone and like we're not good enough. But this Lenten season, I want to remind us that instead of trying to climb these ladders, maybe it's okay to just sit and be where we are. And then to try to nourish our lives through the goodness of God, through scripture and worship and community, so that we can grow in who God is calling us to be. So this morning, we're going to turn to a scripture here in just a moment from Luke um, that's in the lectionary um, text this week. Um, But it's all about uh, things that that grow or don't. (laughs) Um, And as I was preparing for this morning, I found this story from this this pastor at a Presbyterian church in Georgia. Um, And one of the things that that I recognize as, as people is there's a lot of hard things that happen in life. Anyone else recognize that? Like maybe a terrible diagnosis, and you're like, why did that happen? Or you lose someone, or a job, or there's an accident, or something unexpected pops up, and you're like, why in the world did this happen? And as people, we try to come up with answers, right? Sometimes it feels like they seem logical. Other times we're just kind of making them up. But as people, we want to try to find and understand things that make us feel better and comfortable. So there's this pastor in in Georgia, and he tells this story. He says, a few years ago, I was flying with my church group on a mission trip to Haiti, and we were flying um, from one side of the island to another in this little, this little itty-bitty plane. And there was horrible turbulence. Has anyone ever been on a flight where there's awful turbulence? Yes, some of us, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to survive, right? And he says, once we landed, we were thankful to be on solid ground again. And while we were onboarding the baggage, one of the members of the group says to another, well, I wasn't worried at all. Our pastor had his head bowed the whole flight and was praying. And this pastor says, I'm glad she saw me with my head bowed, but I wasn't praying. I just had my head down because I thought that would be the only thing that wouldn't make me throw up, right? So this, this, this parishioner sees her pastor with her head down and is like, oh man, we're going to be on right, right? Because the pastor's praying. Somehow we have like some special connection to God, right? Probably not. But we tend to come up with solutions or answers or expectations to bring us comfort and to make us feel better about wherever we are. And a similar thing happens in Luke's gospel this morning. There's all these people who are around Jesus, and they're asking them these questions. And they're saying, well, did all of this bad stuff happen to this group of people over here because they're bad people? And another way to ask that question is, well, that's not going to happen to me, right? Because I'm not that bad. So bad stuff can't happen to me. And it's a way of bringing in comfort to make yourself feel good, even if that's not really reality. So we're going to read from Luke's gospel this morning. It is in the tradition of our church that we stand for the reading of the gospel. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open it up to Luke chapter 13. We're going to read the first nine verses of this chapter. It says, At that very time there were some present who told him, him meaning Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he said to them, 
Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should I be wasting this soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. For if it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. You may be seated. We like to make stories up to make ourselves feel better. Kind of like that parishioner on the airplane, right? Ah, we're going to be safe just because the pastor has his head down praying. That must mean all will be okay. And sometimes we provide excuses for our lives to try to understand why things are going the way they are. Similar things happen in Luke's gospel. We hear that there are, there are those gathered around Jesus. And we hear that, that some of them, this group of Galileans, that, that Pilate has killed them. It says that he mingled their blood with their sacrifices. And so we assume that they were probably murdered by Pilate, right? On this pilgrimage to bring sacrifices up to the temple in Jerusalem. And then we also hear about these 18 other people who died when the Tower of Siloam fell. And so the question is asked, well, Did they die? Did they have this awful demise because they were worse sinners than someone else? We have questions like this too. Did bad stuff happen to them because they're worse than me, insinuating that that can't possibly happen to me? Or if something bad does happen to us, we say, well, What did we do wrong? What did I do to deserve this? And we pick apart our lives and say, well, I must have done something. Why do bad things happen? Why did Pilate murder these people? Why did that tower fall? And how can we prevent the same things from happening to us and who we love? And so the Galileans are struggling with these answers to this tragic death that they have seen before them. And the biblical answer that they, or the answer that they offer might seem biblical enough, right? In Deuteronomy, we hear that that disobedience results in punishment, not only for the disobedient, but for their children and their grandchildren. But Jesus doesn't buy this answer. Jesus gives a flat-out no. The bad stuff didn't happen to them because they were worse than you. He says, but then he kind of offers this strange phrase. He says, unless you repent, unless you repent, you will perish as they did. And this brings up a whole other kind of host of questions, right? Like, whoa, so like if I don't say I'm sorry, like, Somebody's going to come murder me in my sleep? Like, what? I don't quite understand what you're saying, Jesus. But I think what Jesus is doing here is he's, he's telling us we need to kind of stop focusing on all of those things in our lives that are so far outside of our control, which is so much, and focus on what we can do in here. What little change, or big change, can we make that won't prevent bad things from happening, but instead will allow us to live when they do. Jesus offers this word repentance, which means to to change their minds. To change one mind will lead into a change of conduct. 
The Greek translation of this Hebrew word for repent is shuv. And the, the core of its meaning is to return, to go back, or to go home, is what it means. So often when we hear the word repent, what do you think you're supposed to do? Say, I'm sorry, right? Like, apologize, right? Like, oh, I'm such a terrible person, sorry. That's not really what repent means. Yes, it means recognizing what you've done wrong, right? But more importantly, the repenting is not necessarily about doing something wrong or bad or terrible. The repenting is about reorienting about recognizing that I'm living a life of ladder climbing and trying to be successful, whereas I need to reorient and turn back to what God is calling me to, which is to live lives that are holy and acceptable unto God. So to kind of illustrate this point, he's saying rather than changing or kind of nothing bad's going to happen, he, he then turns to this, this weird parable about fruit producing, this parable of the fig tree, which is kind of a, a strange parable. And it says, I'll read it for you again. He says, then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and had none. Anyone else do that with their tomato plants? Like no tomatoes. That would be me. So he goes and he tells his gardener, because, you know, we all have gardeners, right? So see here, for three years, I keep looking for fruit on this darn fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why am I wasting soil on this stupid tree? It doesn't really say stupid tree. Adding that in. He replied, sir, let alone for one more year. And I'll dig around it and I'll put manure on it. If it bears fruit, well and good. But if not, then you can cut it down. Jesus turns to this parable of this tree who hasn't been producing fruit for three years. And bearing fruit is significant in Luke's gospel. Um, John the Baptist in, in, in Luke 3 describes that, that, that fruit will come if you repent. In the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6, Jesus states that a good tree produces good fruit, and similarly, a good person produces from the goodness of their heart. In the parable of the sower in Luke 8, Jesus explains that those with good hearts will hear the word of God, hold fast to it, and patiently produce fruit. And so we kind of look at these parables as evidence to show that, that, that fruit is representative of our hearts. And if we repent and we reorient our lives to, to God, fruit will be produced. But I think we need to, to reimagine what fruit means Fruit is not money or success. Fruit is not position or power. Whether fruit is what happens in here. It's about recognizing that even when the awful, terrible happens, that the fruit we produce tells us that we are beloved children of God. The fruit that is produced offers peace in the midst of turmoil, offers love in the midst of hate, offers goodness in the midst of bad. But so often, we want to look at life like that fig tree, that unproductive, lazy fig tree that's just bad and awful. We just want to cut it down to make room for a more dedicated and hardworking fig tree, right? But in reality, none of us are probably living up to our full potential. <laughs> Many of us are just like that fig tree, not producing the fruit that the world wants us to produce. But maybe the reason for that is not so much because the fig tree's lazy or the fig tree's bad. But maybe it just hasn't been given the right soil. And I think this is true for us too. Sometimes in our lives, when we feel unproductive or not worthy or whatever it is, 
It may be because we're not putting ourselves in the right soil. How many of you have ever heard, well, if I work hard enough, then I'll have enough money? Or if I'm a good enough parent, my children will never get into trouble. Has anyone ever found that to be true? Anyone have pain in the butt kids that do the wrong things? And I'm pretty sure we're all pretty good parents, most of us, right? Right? I hear laughing. <laughs> I don't think it's that the fig tree is lazy, right? Or that you're not a good enough parent or a good enough worker or a hard enough worker. Maybe it's just that you're not in the right soil. Um, a self-confession that I've told many times is I am a terrible gardener. Anyone else terrible gardeners? Some of us. Everybody else in here is good gardeners. I'm looking at you guys. So my, my grandma even, because I'm such a bad gardener, she bought me a book called First Aid for Plants <laughs> that I still haven't read because I'm a terrible gardener. Although I have one plant in my house that I've managed to keep alive for a whole six months, so I'm pretty excited about it. Okay. And it's not a succulent, all right, so that's even better. <laughs> but, but my grandmother, on the other hand, is a great gardener. In fact, every time I go to her house, uh, I see, see luscious plants blooming, right? And, and we can always go out and, and pick a solid harvest. Because the thing about good gardening is you anticipate and know what the plant needs, right? I, on the other hand, do not anticipate or know what a plant needs. Although I might know that it needs water, but that doesn't mean I'm going to offer it. <sighs> Same is true with our lives, <laughs> Same is true with this fig tree. If we want it to produce good fruit, we have to offer it the manure, the water, the good richness that it needs. And so kind of as you move throughout this Lenten season, I want you to think about those places in your life where you don't feel good enough, where you feel unproductive, where you feel like fruit is not there, Maybe readjust your expectations a little bit. But then also ask yourselves, am I nurturing my soul enough to be able to grow in the goodness of God? Let's pray. Oh God, allow us to fertilize our lives in your goodness. Through your word, through worship, through community, oh God. Allow us to recognize that, that, God, we are called to repentance, that we're called to reorient our lives to you. And, God, that even in the places in our lives that, that we see as, as unproductive or wrong, God, give us the time and the soil to produce the fruit that you call us to. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.